Yeah. Okay, we're good to go. This is Sierra Earl from the Kent County Public Library. We are doing our um, local history and genealogy spring seminar tonight. And we have Abby Carney here. She's our outreach programmer, and she also has a background in German language and literature. And she is going to present tonight for us deciphering old German documents, tips and tricks for easier translation. Um, if you've ever used our genealogy department and you've had a question about translation that stumped us, we usually keep Abby on hand as our <laughs> super duper secret weapon. Um, so we have forwarded things to her in the past and she's been um, very, very wonderful at helping us translate things and reading newspaper scripts. So <laughs> without further ado, I am going to hand it over to Abby. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Good evening, guten Abend, everyone. I'm Abby Carney, as Sierra said, and I'm an outreach programmer for the Kenton County Public Library, which means that I'm usually out in the community doing programs, but sometimes I do have the pleasure of helping the local history and genealogy department with a German translation. And in this presentation, we're going to look at deciphering some old German documents, um, some of my favorite tips and tricks for that and give a quick overview of the different handwritings that you will be encountering or probably have already encountered. First, um, these are a few general things that help when translating anything from German. One that in German, all nouns are capitalized, not just the proper nouns like in English. Um, Two, that verbs are usually the second word in a sentence or come at the end of a longer sentence. But finally, knowing German is only half the battle. Um, I earned my master's degree in German language and literature from the University of Kentucky. And soon after graduating with my degree, people started bringing me old family letters or old German books. And I found myself looking at the old writing and wondering what language is this? It wasn't the Latin script or the Antiqua script that I was used to. And it was really like another language altogether, which is why when you're looking for someone to translate old German documents, it's not enough to find someone who can read and translate German. It's also necessary to find someone who can read the old handwriting. My slide will advance there. So the author of this book that I've been using for my own research a lot emphasizes that actually very few Germans today can competently read the handwriting from documents that were produced before 1900. Um, this book, it's kind of hard to tell the title from the picture, but it's Deciphering Handwriting in German Documents is perhaps the best resource the library has on this subject in book form. Um, at first, it may seem surprising or unexpected that in a book devoted to gleaning information from German documents that it included analyzing Latin and French in the title, but as I'm sure you have run into, documents in German history often contain all of these languages. Therefore, um, step one is really to determine what language the manuscript is written in. And oftentimes knowing the geographical location within Germany especially can aid us in knowing what to expect in translating. So this is Germany and these are some generalizations about documents from the various areas. Documents from the northern regions of Germany are more likely to be in German or more in German than in other areas. The stereotype is that northern Germany is where the high German is spoken. And even though this, is, this isn't exactly true, there are reasons for the stereotype. And from the northern regions, you're going to be more likely to run into documents written entirely in German. Um, the western and southwestern parts of Germany. So the Napoleonic era begins around 1792, which means French occupation in provinces west of the Rhine River. Um, the official records from this area would tend to be in French. Um, also, church records could be missing altogether from this time due to the occupation. And there, there are, of course, exceptions to this, but during this time period, it's not surprising to have your German historical documents from this area in French in their entirety or at least partially. So Southern Germany. In the Southern regions of Germany, the records will be more likely to be kept in Latin. Southern Germany tended to be more Catholic than the Northern regions and Catholic churches kept the records in Latin. Generally, more Catholic areas tended to keep the records in Latin, but many Protestant records were also still kept in Latin. So there's no definitive rule on which language. 
The writing also tended to combine what we refer to as the old German script and Antiqua, what we recognize and read more easily, especially for proper names and anything in Latin. The Latin alphabet is also used for the French parts, making them generally easier to read, especially if you can read French. It's most important to keep in mind that what we think of as Germany today is relatively young and the borders have changed a lot over the years. The German Empire was first established in 1871, and this coincided with a, with a real rise in literacy and necessitated a move toward a more standardized handwriting. And so there were a lot of different handwritings at this time period. The most common perhaps is what, what they call current, um, it's considered the original Old German curse of writing, and it was in use until 1941. It's the handwritten counterpart to the typeface known as Fraktur, or what we call Gothic script. And this is an example of some very old current writing. This is an example um, of the Old German handwriting from FamilySearch.org, and I can't emphasize enough how many resources they have on learning from Old German writing. Um, if you check out their German wiki for word lists for common vocabulary names, you name it, they have so many resources. And this is an image of the current handwriting from a textbook from 1903. And again, this is, it's the handwritten counterpart to the Fraktur typeface, we usually think of as Gothic writing, which is used now mostly in advertisements. And it's definitely easier to read than the handwriting, but it still presents some difficulties when an entire book's printed in Fraktur. So the first attempt to introduce a standard handwriting alphabet in German schools was actually in Prussia in 1714. And it was called Current, and it's from the Latin currens, meaning running, and was the handwritten form of Fraktur. Um, then Sutleren was developed as an easier to write version of current. It was developed by a graphic artist from Vienna named Ludwig Sutleren, which is where it gets its name. And then an even more practical set of characters were designed by another artist called Offenbach script in 1927. These traditional German ways of writing were used exclusively until 1941 when they were abruptly replaced by the Antiqua and Latin script. So the Antiqua and Latin script had been declared non-Aryan for a time under the Nazis and were effectively forbidden. The Nazis, however, came out with a decree in 1941 reversing this and claiming that fraktur, current, and all these traditional ways of writing were of Jewish origin and thus were abolished. Current was no longer taught in schools thanks to this degree. And um, the author of the book I mentioned at the beginning notes that he observed that fewer than 1% of Germans today can read the handwriting samples now because of that decree. Um, therefore, it really makes deciphering anything written before 1941 incredibly difficult even for native German speakers and presents a definite challenge for researchers. Some German schools still taught the old scripts in optional afternoon classes. Here's an old primer entitled Wer kann das lesen or who can read that? It was printed in 1954. This was from um, the used book section of the German Amazon. I forget how much it was going for. And this is the only option that I found for teaching yourself the writing, the Deutsche Schreibschiff Lesen und Schreiben Lernen um, by Harold Zeus. And that's this is the only book that I found for practicing writing the letters on your own because doing that has given me a lot more confidence in translating. There's also something through familysearch.org, this script tutorial. I'll quickly just show you that webpage. You can take letters tests and really gives you a lot of confidence in starting to recognize how the different letters are formed and you start recognizing them in more and more words. They also digitized an entire book that was used in German elementary schools for teaching writing. And that's just been really fascinating to go through and sort of learn the writing as a school child would have learned it. 
But this online class series through FamilySearch.org, Old German Scripts Part 1, 2, and 3, is by far the best that I've found. The idea of the class is to give you an overview, and it's for people with little to no knowledge of German, even though the more you know, I think the better, ultimately. But um, the three-part class is available through FamilySearch.org. Like I said, it's online. It's free. You can go through it as many times as needed. And it gave me a lot more confidence in attempting to translate old German handwriting. This is the link for that. Really incredible class series. And I've used several examples um, of some of the writing from this class. So those are the things that I've done to sharpen my skills at reading and translating the old writing. And here following is a summary or an overview of the most important things that I've learned or the things that have helped me the most. Okay, the first one is to look for the U-bogens or the U-curves, the U-curved lines. The two words that we're looking at are getauft and taufen. Does anyone know what those words mean? Anyone want to say in the chat what they mean? <laughs> to the side is a close up of the letter U. And it looks like the way we write a U with a short vowel sign over it. And again, this is simply the way that the letter is written. The U with the with the bogan over it is how the little u was made. So when you see the little smiley face lines, you automatically know that you're looking at the letter u. And it looks like in the chat, yes, getauft and taufen both have to do with baptism. Getauft, baptize, taufen, baptism. Excellent, good job. So the u bogans can tell us that we're looking at the letter u. The umlauts are two small slanted lines over certain vowels. Sometimes the ubogen can be mistaken for an umlaut, but the umlauts are formed completely differently. We usually are able to identify them easier, and we usually use two dots for the umlauts, but they were um, two slanted lines in a lot of this handwriting. Here's an example. The umlauts look very different than the ubogens. And only certain vowels can have an umlaut over them. The vowels are A, O, and U. They're the only vowels that can have umlauts. And when not written with an umlaut, the vowels are written followed by the letter E. So a lot of the time, if you have a German name and there's an A, E, O, o E, or U, E in it, then at some point in the past, it was spelled with an umlaut instead of the E. Um, and there's a good reason for this practice as well. In the Middle Ages, instead of two, um, two lines or two dots over the letter, it was a small E written over the letter. And you'll see how this developed um, by the next tip we look at, which is recognizing the letter E. So the letter E looks like scribbles or the letter N. At worst, it looks like scribbles. At best, it looks like the letter N. These are three examples of the letter E. And it bears absolutely no resemblance to anything that I would have thought of as an E, and it really did look like scribbles to me. Here's an example of a name. See if you can pick out the letter E in that name. There it is. Anyone wanna try translating that name? We're gonna talk about more of the letters, but can anyone recognize that? Any guesses? Good guess. The name is actually Theodore. <laughs> the, name, yeah, the name is actually Theodore. And that E is one of the things that um, can throw me off completely, but some of the other letters too, and we're gonna talk about those coming up. But first, let's look at the ending ER because it's such an important ending in German. Um, something with ER at the end is typically masculine and, and it would tend to show that we're talking about a male. A good example of this would be Bauer, farmer. And it's going to end in an ER if it's a male and IN if it's a female. The ER is pretty hard to recognize. It helps knowing the E looks like an N. 
but those are both ER endings. IN is also an important ending. Um, it's the counterpart to the ER. It typically shows that the word is feminine or that we're talking about a female, Bauer in instead of Bauer, um, but it tends to be easier to recognize. You can see the dotted I and the N because the N also looks like an N, which is the next letter we're gonna look at. A lot of letters in this old German writing look like Ns. So the N also looks like an N. We talked about the E looking like an N. So does N. Here's the N and there's the E. Very, very, very close. And that's when practicing the handwriting and learning the strokes actually really does come in handy because you can notice the, the smaller differences a little bit easier. These are examples of words with Ns and Es does anyone want to guess any of these? They really look like scribbles. Knowing the ubogans helps. Knowing um, dotted eyes helps. And it's not a sentence. It's just a series of four words. Does anyone want to guess at those? Hey. Not bad. The first word is ein. And the last word is immer. Not bad. All right. This is what we're looking at. The first word is ein, neu, nun, and immer. With all the similarities between the N's and the E's and then even the U's, it could make a lot of phrases and sentences in the old German documents look like a bunch of scribbles. Another trick is that a line over the letter N was a shorthand way to indicate that the letter should be doubled. And it could be mistaken, uh, the line over the actual end could be mistaken for a ubogen, I think. Um, here's an example. The straight line over the end there means that it should be doubled and it's, it's, it's a last name. Does anyone wanna guess what the last name is? We know there's a double N. Close. It's actually Nenner. That's a capital N at the beginning. Nenner. And the line can be used over the letter M as well. It's just not as common, but um, that was a shorthand way of saying double this letter. Another tip is to look for keywords and don't worry about endings. Germans build their words around a root word, and the root word is usually in the middle. Prefixes will often be GE or BE or VE, things like that. Um, the suffixes will be EN, IN, ER, ES, things like that. Um, focus on the middle parts of the words, especially since the E looks like scribbles, and there can be a lot of extra letters that are going to give you much more information, and you'll get more information from the root word. Here's some examples. The root word of these two are in the middle. B-O-R, B-O-H-R. Does anyone wanna guess what these two words are talking about? They both have to do with the same thing. Yeah, born, yeah, exactly. These are two spellings of the word geboren. Again, be open to creative ways of spellings. There weren't a lot of rules on spelling yet. And then in the next set, we have the tauf again. So these are all words having to do with baptism. Getauften, getauften, taufen. So focusing on the root words can help you cut out several letters that don't necessarily have to be readable and you don't need to translate them or worry about them and still get the meaning of of what you're looking at. Another tip that has helped me a lot in translating is that the capital B looks like the capital L. 
This is a capital B in the old writing. And it threw me off so many times that I've lost count. But that is a capital B. And just writing it, practicing it, and learning to recognize it helps so much. Here is an example of two words. Two words, both beginning with B, the first with a lowercase b, and it's much more recognizable to me that that's a lowercase b in the first word, but the second word I wouldn't necessarily read as a b. If I'm consulting word list, I would be looking in the wrong section and looking under L because that I read that as an L. And these two words also share a root word. Um, they both have to do with the erdit, meaning buried. So this, these two words both have to do with burials. <clears throat> One of the easiest to remember things I learned in the online course through Family Search um, is the funny saying that when in doubt, guess G. The capital G is written in so many ways, and I found myself trying to translate the letter often and never recognizing it. Now, when I run across a capital letter that bears absolutely no resemblance to anything on my list, I try a G and it's helped on several occasions. These are two examples of the name George. That G I would almost recognize except for the, the extra lines I would have thought was another letter. That's just a capital G. And then there's a completely different looking capital G, both the name George. The G, the capital G is often difficult to recognize, but the lowercase not as difficult, at least not that I've come across. These are some examples of words with the lowercase G. And if you also notice the ubogans, you start to recognize more and more letters. Another letter that will throw you off is the letter H. We'll look at some names here. These names both begin with the letter H, and I do not read that as a letter H at all. The first name is Henrietta, and the second is Hans, because, um, because it goes below the line, the letter does, it throws us off. And notice the E's in those names and the S's. But Henrietta and Hans difficult to recognize. Another letter that will throw you off is the letter S and so many examples of the letter S. Here are three names beginning with the letter S. Knowing that they begin with the letter S helps. Does anyone want to read any of those names? What's the first one? Simon, excellent. Yeah, Simon is definitely the first name. I think the, the third one, the one on the bottom is maybe the hardest to recognize, at least it was for me. The second name, the second name is Susanna, good job. And the third name, Not Samuel, good guess, no. That is Sarah, the third name is actually Sarah, S-A-R-A. -A. I could have an entire slide dedicated to the letter R too, that can be off putting too. Just to be nice and confusing, there are actually three different ways to write the letter S depending on where it is in a word. There's the beginning of the word S, the middle of the word S, and the end of the word S. This is a line of all the different, of several ways to write the letter S. I'm sure not all the ways, but this is from the familysearch.org class. Um, and this was one of the examples that he had early on. These are all examples that he's found of people handwriting the letter S. So any of these are things that you could encounter. It can also help with months. When I see these months in German, 
it's very recognizable. They're pretty easy to recognize the letters as well as the words themselves. German and English have a lot of cognates like this, but unfortunately it's not always the case. And so recognizing the letter S really helps recognizing this as a month. What month is that going to be? It has to be September, right? And not knowing the letter S, I wouldn't have recognized that as a month at all. But there's the S and the E, ER at the end, September. Let's look at some names with the letter S. There's some practice. All right. This first one, the first name begins with the letter S. The second one does as well, but then has an S in the middle of the name as well. And then the final one ends with the letter S. So anyone want to guess any of these names? Got a few S's here. Sebastian, Sebastian is one of them. Good job. <laughs> Sebastian and Hans, yeah, the first one isn't correct. Yeah, we got Hans in there. The third one is Hans. So we have something, Sebastian and Hans. The first one is actually Stefan. Stefan, Sebastian, and Hans. All right, good job. Now these two examples are the same name written in different handwriting styles. Anyone want to guess the name before I go on and talk about what's some of the writing in this name? They both begin with the letter S. And it has a double S in the middle. It's Susanna. Good job. Yes. Susanna. These are two different ways to write Susanna with a double S in the middle. Um, you can definitely see different handwriting styles here. And that's part of the challenge with any sort of translating. The beginning S is a little more recognizable as an S in the second one, maybe. Um, the U bogan gives a hint for the U, but the the S set, the double S is definitely less pronounced in the second one, but both of them are the name Susanna. Here are two more examples of an S set. Now, historically, the S set was the letter S plus the letter Z, but now it's come to mean just two S's and that's the way it's pronounced and that's, that's the way it's written if you don't have, um, if you don't want to write the big letter B looking character, you can just write two S's for the S set. But these are two examples. But the S set is one of several letter combinations in German language. This is, a, is an example from Harold Zeus's Deutsche Schreibschrift book. Um, the CH, the CK, the S set, the TZ, these are all letter combinations and they were taught to be written together. And this is another sort of letter that you have to learn to recognize of how they looked when they were combined. And if you look at the S set, you can see that it looks like the middle of the word S combined with the letter Z. So let's talk about documents. My main advice with documents is breaking them down into smaller parts and using the process of elimination. Documents that are printed definitely help. Um, these, these examples are from printed documents. So this is the birth record of my husband's grandfather. And I'm just going to look at, just focus in on some parts of it. It's easier to read, of course, when it's printed, but I see the word religion and that's a cognate in English. So I know that we're gonna be talking about religion and I can see 
it's a word that I would not be able to pick out every letter of. And if I don't know German, it's going to be extremely difficult, but it just looks like scribbles. But knowing what the letter E looks like, I can see that there is an E at the beginning of this word. And at the time, there are going to be very few religions to choose from for this document. And it's going to either be Catholish or Evangelish, a Protestant. And I can tell that it begins with the letter E and that it's going to be Evangelish. And so that's just process of elimination and taking parts that I can already recognize. And then I can compare that to here his marriage record later on. And I find religion there as well. And I see that the letters have changed and that it now this scribbled word begins with something that is not an E and it resembles the K. And I know that somewhere between the time that he was born and the time that he got married, that this changed and now he's Catholish religion. But it's so much easier with printed documents to be able to pick out words. And then this is from my husband's great grandfather. And I see that Von Hapsu, where he lives, I can read that and look it up in a German dictionary. The, the printed words are pretty easy to, to translate and understand. But looking where he's Von Hapsu, where he lives, I look at this big letter that looks like a fancy letter L. And so that's going to tell me that it's going to be a capital B and I see an E and I'm able to then deduce that he's probably living in Berlin. And so that's just through process of elimination and very few letters to be able to glean some information from these documents, but not all documents are printed. Uh, one of the examples in the um, familysearch.org class he showed this handwritten column documents. And this one is pretty neat handwriting. And I'm sure that there are lots of examples that are not this neat and tidy. But one of the things that he emphasized with these was to immediately look for numbers and years and to see what kind of information you can start gleaning from that. And this, I can immediately find the year on at 1838 and start to go from there with trying to extract some information. Maybe the hardest, um, most difficult kind of document to decipher is the narrative documents, which tend to be older. And the key here is to look for numbers first, look for keywords. One handy thing to remember is that the name of the person that it's about is typically underlined or written larger. Um, but I definitely can find ages and numbers in this document and start to make sense of it because there's going to be a lot of extra words and letters that are going to be almost unreadable for pretty much everyone. So some other considerations. First, I'm going to have to mention Google Translate. Um, Google Translate has improved over the years. There was a time that I would have advised against using it entirely. However, that's no longer the case, although it's certainly not a guarantee that your grammar is going to be correct or your cho choice of wording is going to be correct. It does give a fairly accurate group of vocabulary words to work with. So I'm not completely against Google Translate. We do have one example here um, of how Google Translate doesn't always work. This was something sent to me by the local history department and Google Translate had gotten most of it correct, but it had translated an old fashioned word for neckties as scarves, and it had sort of thrown off what the person's profession was. So it doesn't always work, but it can give you, it can get you at least in the right direction and get you a lot of vocabulary words. Another trick with this is if you go to a German website and you're looking for some information some information there, like if you're looking for, for a library or something like that, you can actually go to the website and I'm going to click on this and we're going to visit this library website from a small town outside of Munich. And you can right click on it. And then you can scroll down and say translate to English. And it won't be a perfect translation, but it will help you find more of what you're looking for on the web page. And that's something helpful for looking up anything in foreign languages. And
And speaking of libraries, you're going to be looking for um, the Bücherei when you're looking for the library in German. There are two words for library in German and understanding the difference between them is important in research. The word that's typically used for library in German is Bibliothek, but it refers more to an academic or a private library, whereas a Bücherei is going to be a local public library and it may have more of the local type records that you're looking for. Another consideration to have with um, doing research in German is the idea that find a grave is probably not going to be all that helpful. Unless you're looking for the grave of a famous person like Goethe's here that's pictured, um, good luck because Germans do grave recycling. This is an image of one of my husband's German relatives and her grave. So in Germany, a grave is leased. The idea of perpetual care is completely foreign. On average, a grave is leased for about 15 to 30 years, and then the family has the opportunity to continue leasing it after this time, but keeping a grave forever um, isn't something that's done. After the lease is up, or if the cemetery officials can't locate any family um, to continue paying on the lease, then the grave is cleaned out and anything like a grave marker is recycled and someone else can be buried in the grave. The family is also completely responsible for the grave's upkeep, so it's a completely different system. However, if you go to a web page and um, you want to write the administrative office of a cemetery, you could find out if a person had been buried there and you can get that information, but you can be prepared for a response like the following that I got, where they told me that the de Graeber, de, de Großeltern, the graves of the grandparents of your, of your husband have been abgeräumt, which means that they've been cleared out and cleaned up and are ready to be used by someone else. But they were able to tell me that they had been buried in that cemetery. And this is only for a grave that would have been about 50 years old. And now finally, just for fun, I wanna point you in the direction of these two wonderful websites where you can um, write your name in the old script. One of them only does Sudlerin, but you can, um, not only is it just fun, you can also test some of your, your guesses in a document. You can look at the letters and what you think you're looking at and put it in here and see if the word does in fact look like the word on the document that you're trying to translate. And the second one has different ones. It's not just super and it's different writing styles as well. So these can both be a lot of fun and help with um, some educated guesses with your documents. All right. Well, thank you for joining me. And this is my contact information. And I would love to take your questions and hopefully get some um, translating jobs from you in the future. Let me know what I can help you with. And what are some of your tips and tricks that you've learned over the years going through German documents?